Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have been on a virtual road trip across the United States, exploring various locations and sites supported by the Historic Artist Homes and Studios program. Today, we are on the fifth stop of the six part series, visiting the Roger Brown SETI collection in Chicago, Illinois. We are committed to making this program accessible. Today, we are integrating accessibility through live captions and through American Sign Language. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the live transcript at the bottom of your screen, then selecting show subtitle. You can adjust your view of today's presentation by selecting view options and finding the best view that serves your needs. We actively encourage you to send questions, comments, and thoughts to us throughout this presentation. You can do this by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to share with us. We will also have time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. Uh, today's event is being recorded and will be made available in the coming days. This is a virtual road trip in collaboration between the James Castle House located in Boise, Idaho, the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and five other participating historic artist sites, such as the Roger Brown SETI Collection, a special collection of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago that exists as a artist study collection and archive preserved intact as a house museum in a former home to the artist Roger Brown. My name is Rachel Reichert, and I am your guide on this virtual road trip. I am the cultural sites manager for the city of Boise and the program director at the James Castle House. And with me today is Valerie Belint, the program manager of Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program. Hello, Valerie. Uh, along with uh, Valerie is James Connolly, who is the collection manager at the Roger Brown Study Collection, who will be our guide today. Hello, James. We Hello. also have Sarah McIver offering live ASL interpretation during today's event. So we are honored to have an opportunity to bring you into the homes and studios, even if it is virtually, to learn more about six remarkable artists and the spaces that supported their art making practices. As you may know, today's tour is a part of a series of tours, each exploring a different artist home and studio, which has been offered monthly through August and will be continued through August. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to sign up for our last tour, or if you'd like to view our past tours, we will add links in the chat where you can learn more about that. For those of you just learning about the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, um, also commonly referred to as HAAS, this is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which currently is a coalition of 48 museums that were previously homes and working studios to many artists. Through its support and advocacy, Haas is helping to preserve the nation's legacy of creativity and the visual arts. This program aims to connect meaningful visitor experiences at authentic creative places. All Haas sites are public spaces, and I hope we can all actually venture out into the real world and visit these incredible museums in person, many of which are open now or about to open. I also recommend checking Haas out online to learn more about the sites we're discussing through this virtual road trip series and all the other homes and studios they support at artisthomes.org. You can also join their mailing list or engage with them on various social platforms, all of which we will add links in the chat now. Okay, because this is a virtual road trip, I just wanna set the stage real quick with a few travel notes to consider before we get started. Um, James, you can switch the set. There you go. Last month, we visited the Melrose Plantation, where artist Clementine Hunter lived and worked. Today, we're traveling from Natchitoches, Louisiana, to Chicago, Illinois, which is approximately a 20-hour drive. So from the Melrose Plantation, we will drive north across the border to Little Rock, Arkansas, for a tour of the Central High School National Historic Site, the school at which the Little Rock Nine took first steps towards integration in public schools. From Little Rock, we'll drive east across the border into Memphis, Tennessee, visiting the Crystal Shrine Grotto designed by Mexican artist Donico Rodriguez. 
a man-made cave with stalactites and stalagmites. We'll also visit a few more popular sites, the National Civil Rights Museum, the Blues Hall of Fame Museum, Stax Museum of American Soul Music, and the Sun Studios, which is, as we all may know, the birthplace of rock and roll. We will quickly stop in Nashville, Tennessee for a tour of Hat Showprint, the legendary design shop known for its woodblock prints of classic country music stars. From there, we'll drive across the border into Kentucky to visit the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft in Louisville to find the work of self-taught artist Marvin Flynn, who is known for exquisitely carved wooden toys and uh, constructed cranes, shovels, and bulldozers inspired by the Louisville dockyards. We'll drive down through Indiana, crossing the Indiana-Illinois border to our destination, the Roger Brown Study Collection. I've asked Valerie to offer a few notes uh, to provide context on the place where Roger Brown is located before we hand it over to James. Valerie, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, to you and everyone at the James Castle House for spearheading this virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artists Homes and Studios. I'm excited to have us focus today on an artist who created an immersive art environment at his home and studio in Chicago, Roger Brown. I have had the distinct pleasure of visiting this site on four occasions, the most recent in February of 2019, my very last trip before the pandemic took hold, so it now has a special place in my heart. In turn, Chicago is a city I love, a great gateway to modernism and design where iconic 19th century architecture sits right alongside cutting edge buildings of the recent moment and everywhere in between. With so many robust neighborhoods, I had to pick one orientation point for first time visitors. So it will be no surprise to frequent Chicago visitors um, that I chose the Magnificent Mile and Michigan Avenue. It brings together for me all the key intersecting elements of this city, majestic buildings set against um, stunning waterways and um, a plethora of green space. To get an overview, I would suggest experiencing it from two vital but completely different vantage points from the soaring and slightly uh, death defying sky deck of the former old Sears building now known as Willis Tower to uh, the fisheye lens of a meandering boat tour where all the buildings rise up around you. Once oriented, um, walk Michigan Avenue, and I mean on both sides of the avenue, uh, making sure to take in the exquisite details of individual buildings and not just the collective sweeping skyline. Of course, Chicago made a mark as a modern city more than a century ago as the host of the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition, and the underpinnings of that white city can still be felt today. The Art Institute of Chicago, which you see at right, with its related art school, stand as one of the most influential art institutions in the nation, housed in a building whose core was built for this exhibition and has been expanded several times. This bastion of arts education has seen countless students and artists cross its halls, including, albeit for a short time, Roger Brown. It anchors Southern Michigan Avenue with an easy and scenic walk to the famous History Field Museum, nearby views of elevated train lines, which are a hallmark of this city and Lake Michigan. A day at this museum, and that is really what you should spend here, is to encounter some of the most iconic and recognizable images in our nation's art, but also many artists representing sites within the Haas network. Grant Wood's American Gothic, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, and Southwestern works by Georgia O'Keeffe have all been become part of our larger visual um, vocabulary and part of popular culture. But other lesser known works, such as Charles Demas, and the home of the brave at upper right allow us to make connections between these artists. This painting, once in the collection of her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, was given to the museum by Georgia O'Keeffe as they were both uh, close friends of this artist. 
The museum is a wonderful introduction to those artists who represent Haas sites, not only modernists like those here, but also masters of the late 19th century, such as sculptor Daniel Chester French, sculptor of the Lincoln Memorial, whose brother William Merchant, Merchant Richardson French served as the museum's first president. One of the things I love most about Chicago is its abundance and diversity of city parks, each with its own distinct character. Walking north up Michigan Avenue from the Art Institute, you will soon encounter Millennium Park um, created in the late 1990s. It actually sits atop a parking garage and commuter rail station and is considered the world's largest rooftop garden. Make sure that among the many fantastic public works of art, you take in CloudGate, affectionately known as The Bean, created by using computer technology to cut massive stainless steel plates into precise shapes that were then pieced together like a puzzle. That's me outright taking a photograph underneath this uh, sensory wonder where perceptions are altered like a carnival funhouse mirror. You can hear your own voice echo under the concave roof and run your hand, because it's not in a museum, over 110 tons of glass-like cool metal. Close by, um, one of the many impressive skyscraper holds um, for many an unexpected gem, the award-winning American Writers Museum, which I had the pleasure of visiting in 2017, the year it opened. As an undergrad lit major, the compact but robust museum located on a single upper floor offered me hours of delight. Take in the state-of-the-art exhibits and interactives, including entering your own favorite books to see if they make it onto the ongoing digital scoreboard of trending publications, which is what you see at top, or sit down and try your hand at eking out an opening salvo on an old school typewriter. Leave with one, or in my case, 10, of their free bookmarks highlighting artists whose homes have been preserved as public sites. And that's a wonderful parallel to the Haas network. After strolling up the Magnificent Mile, just a short walk to the Driehaus Collection, a historic house and decorative arts museum, which is, serves as an exemplar of the Gilded Age, opened in 2003 after meticulous renovation by Chicago businessman, entrepreneur, collector, and philanthropist Richard Driehaus, who just passed away this spring. The building, called the Marble Palace, was originally built for banker Samuel Nickerson and his wife, society leader Matilda. This spectacular Tiffany glass dome is just one of the marbles that awaits you inside. This couple was actively involved in the World's Fair, loaning works from their own art collection. Throughout the city, there are myriad touchstones that lead you back to this seminal event. For devotees of public sculpture, like myself, encountering these works by artistic masters around unexpected bends and in weird places is a rare treat. As someone who started their career at Chesterwood, the home of Daniel Chester French, sculptor of the iconic Republic, which presided over the Columbian Exhibition's Lagoon, it was fun for me to visit Jackson Park and see the commemorative, much more diminutive version the artist was commissioned to create 15 years after the fair. At a very small 24 feet tall, the gilded bronze is best known today as the Golden Lady. And at the Garfield Park Conservatory, which boasts six greenhouses, you can visit bronze versions of French's bulls and maidens representing goddesses of grain and corn. The original and much larger plaster works grace the exhibition's entrance to the livestock exhibition, or stroll through Graceland Cemetery and encounter French's memorial to Marshall Field, the founder of the great department store Emporium, which was a hallmark of Chicago worldwide for more than a century. But French is not the only monumental sculptor represented in Chicago's myriad green spaces, whose home is now preserved as a Haas site. Meander through sprawling Grant Park and encounter St. Gaudens Lincoln, head of state. St. Gaudens home and studio is preserved in Cornish, New Hampshire. Or music by Aubin Palaszczuk, who served for decades as head of the sculpture department at the School of the Arts Institute, and whose retirement home in Winter Park, Florida, is now a public site. 
Elsewhere, you can see other works by St. Gaudens and Palaszczuk, such as the, um, the Lincoln, the man in uh, Lincoln Park and Palaszczuk's The Sower at the Botanical Gardens. The centerpiece of Grant Park is the Buckingham Fountain, which shoots uh, water 150 feet in the air. The fountain itself represents Lake Michigan with four sets of seahorses, symbolizing the four states, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana that border the lake. But in this city, you can also find fantastic art in completely unexpected places, including this amazing mosaic piece by none other than Roger Brown, just several blocks west of the Millennium Park and across the street from City um, Hall on North LaSalle Street. Gracing the facade of an office building, the piece depicts the famous mythological story of Daedalus and Icarus. It was created from more than 900,000 glass tiles assembled in Italy and took three weeks to install. The Roger Brown collection owns several sketches for this work, including the one on screen. Brown's home, uh, with our which our amazing guy James will introduce us to momentarily, is located in another wonderful neighborhood, Lincoln Park, which boasts its own varied attractions, including the famous Steppenwolf Theater, fantastic restaurants, which I know from personal experience, and a zoo. And you could spend days enjoying this section of town as I have without actually ever stepping foot on um, the Magnificent Mile. But even within this arts mecca, that is this city, Roger, the Roger Brown experience, as I like to think of it, remains uh, unique. From the moment you enter this space, you feel like you are been, being taken on a fantastical journey and everywhere are objects. For a former curator like myself, this is a dream come true. I have been there numerous times, but there is always something new to see here. This is a total work of art created by an artist who could be irreverent, but also revered and reveled in the well-designed object, who took the concept of salon hanging to new dimensions and new heights in what I can only describe as a pave setting. Fearless in his collecting and display, he invites us to all do the same, to collect the things we love that inspire us and to live with them without apology. His own art is complex, as James will help us explore, as is his personal narrative. My thanks to James and to you, Rachel, as we step into Brown's singular world. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that incredible introduction. I think we all hope to one day go on a road trip with you. Um, now on to James Connolly from the Roger Brown Study Collection to share more about Roger Brown and his incredible collections, space, and art practice. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody at the James Castle House for organizing this really fantastic series of events. And thank you, Valerie, for that incredible introduction to the city of Chicago and Roger Brown. Uh, you really set us up nicely. But my name is James Connolly, and I'm the collection manager of the Roger Brown Study Collection. Um, I'm also an artist. I'm coming to you from my studio rather than the Roger Brown Study Collection itself. And I teach in the Department of Film Video uh, new Media and Animation at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. But I want to start today off with a land acknowledgement. The Roger Brown Study Collection and the campus of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago are located on the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Hochuk, Menominee, and Fox, also called this area home. The region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Members of this community continue to contribute to the city of Chicago in countless ways and to celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the lands and waterways. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Native American Student Association at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for their leadership in improving our community and making our school a more inclusive space. The RBSC, as I call the Roger Brown Study Collection, holds many objects made by indigenous cultures from around the world that Roger Brown collected. And we are currently prioritizing the research into these items to ensure that we better understand, interpret and display them. And that we properly honor the cultures and individuals who made them using reparative language and creating a space where all members of our community feel welcome. So the Roger Brown Study Collection or the RBSC is a special collection of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which I'll commonly refer to as SAIC. 
Uh, we are located, as has been mentioned, in the former home of the Chicago artist Roger Brown, who lived, uh, who was born in 1941 and passed away in 1997. We have preserved Roger's major art collection and we install it uh, using his original installation. And we exist as a resource for emerging artists and to give future museum professionals hands-on work experience. So other than myself, all of our staff members are actually students currently studying at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And we create a space for hands-on learning in a professional museum environment. Uh, so we're a really great example of a Haas site. We are using a historic artist home and studio to allow emerging museum curators uh, art historians, art critics, and artists of all mediums to work with and be inspired by a huge collection of wide-ranging objects from around the world, and to have one very intimate view into one particular artist's life, that being Roger Brown. But to continue this theme of a road trip, um, if you were to be, if you were a student at the school and coming from our campus, or if any of you were at the Art Institute and wanted to visit the Roger Brown study collection, you could come here through the uh, Brown Line, the elevated train, taking it about 25 minutes north to Armitage. This would give you a really fantastic view of the city looking over the Chicago River right here. This is kind of going in the opposite direction. I took this going downtown from the RBSC, but you can see the really great view that it gives you. And so when you get to the Roger Brown study collection, you can see the more than 2000 objects that Roger collected over the years that are installed in our space, as I mentioned, for the most part, exactly how we lived with them. Uh, Roger generously donated this collection to the school in 1996. With all of these objects, not only do we tell the story of Roger's life, but also the lives of the artists whose work Roger acquired, lived with, and was inspired by. So this evening, I will be talking about the history of our space, the life and art of Roger Brown, and some of the countless narratives that come from our incredible collection of art found in everyday objects from around the world. Uh, we'll talk about Roger Brown's work and how it was informed by his collection, and how the collection grew from a particular culture of collecting that began in the mid 20th century in Chicago and continues into today. Uh, the image that we see right now is Roger Brown standing in 1975 in front of the building that is now the Roger Brown study collection. Uh, he bought this building a year earlier in 1974 for less than $18,000. Um, and so even adjusted for inflation, Lincoln Park was not the affluent neighborhood that it is today. But the building itself was built in 1888. It had a storefront space that became Roger Brown's studio. Um, that's behind the doors that he's standing in front of. And the second floor was a series of small apartments that really were kind of small and too uh, claustrophobic to properly house his collection. If you look closely at this slide, this is a page from an artist book that Roger made called uh, For George. It was a kind of autobiography that Roger made for himself. But on the left, you can see the floor plan of the building, the second floor when Roger bought the building. And on the right, you can see the redesign by his partner, George Veranda, who is a modern architect. And so this is George Veranda, who was Roger's partner from 1972 until George's incredibly tragic death from lung cancer in 1984. And so these two individuals were together for 12 years and Roger cited George as being one of the most important influences on his life and art practice. Uh, George was a successful modern architect who not only redesigned the home that he had with Roger in Chicago, the home that is now the RBSC, but he also designed a home for them to live in in New Buffalo, Michigan, which was completed in 1982, only two years before his death. And so you can see an image of that home on the right, which has large uh, walls that are entirely glass, kind of open to nature, a very modern design. So in many ways, the house that is preserved as the Roger Brown study collection is a collaboration between these two artists, between Roger the collector and George the architect. Uh, George completely opened up the interior of the space, creating an architectural environment where you can see across the entire building. He enabled the viewer to kind of see endless juxtapositions between these objects that Roger collected and arranged. He also installed shelving around the entire perimeter of the building for Roger to arrange objects on. And he really kind of created a system of order that allowed Roger's maximalist installation methods to kind of work and flow. Um, I mentioned that George Veranda tragically died of lung cancer in 1984. Um, Roger had a tragic passing himself. In the late 1980s, he was diagnosed with HIV AIDS. And as he became aware of his own mortality, he made a series of incredibly generous donations to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He actually donated that home in New Buffalo, Michigan to the school. Um, which is now used as a faculty and staff retreat. It is not open to the public. And then the following year in 1996, he donated this building, which became the Roger Brown Study Collection. 
And so this is Rogers Home in New Buffalo, Michigan, designed by George Veranda. This shot of the interior gives, a sen gives you a sense of the kind of amazing modern feeling that it has. And Roger also had a home and collection in La Conchita, California that was designed by the truly great Chicago architect, Stanley Tigerman. Um, this is a home that's located in California. So the school was unable to manage it from Chicago. Um, it's since been sold and is not open to the public because it's owned by a private owner. Um, but all three collections were really unique. And Roger kind of reacted to the area and the country that he was living in when he formed them. Uh, his three homes and collections are also a testament to his commercial success as an artist. Um, from 1971, one year out of graduate school until the end of his life in 1997, Roger was represented by Phyllis Kind uh, at the Phyllis Kind Gallery. And so through Phyllis's galleries in Chicago and in New York, uh, he was able to sell a huge amount of work because he was an incredibly hardworking artist. He created over 900 major works of art throughout his entire career and most of those sold in his lifetime. Um, and he actually never had to have a day job to support his art practice. He really thought of painting as his day job and would often be in the studio Monday through Friday, five days a week as if it was a kind of day job. But uh, Phyllis worked really hard to get her artists well known in the world and to get them into major collections. And so you can see Roger Brown artworks in several major museum correction, collections around the country and world. And I can't tell the story of the Roger Brown City Collection without citing our curator, um, our former curator and first curator, Lisa Stone, uh, who was brought in to manage the Roger Brown Study Collection when Roger was still living. Uh, Lisa knew Roger personally. And so he, Roger worked with Lisa to set up the space. And it was really Lisa's curatorial vision to keep Roger's collection intact in his home exactly as we, he lived with it. And so we continued Lisa's original uh, vision after she retired in 2020. And the RBSC would absolutely not exist without Lisa's work and leadership. So thank you, Lisa. But because of Lisa's work and because of Roger's incredible and his incredibly generous gifts and donations, the RBSC has been used to enrich the educational experience of students for many years. We've given thousands and thousands of tours to thousands of students. Uh, students have had exhibition openings in our front gallery space, which used to be Roger's studio. They have shot films and videos on site. This is a student shooting with Roger's 1967 Ford Mustang, which is in our garage. They've installed their artworks in our space. This is a student's installation in Roger's uh, shower, which we no longer use. And of course, we've had dozens of students with professional game, professional experience uh, by working on our collections and archives. But to go back to the story of Roger Brown's life, uh, we always like to start with his childhood when we introduce him. And so this is a photo of Roger when he was five years old with his mother. And it was taken in 1941. Or I'm sorry, it was taken in 1946. But Roger was born in 1941 in Hamilton, Alabama, but grew up in Opelika, Alabama. Um, and this image is really interesting. We're kind of still discovering some of the photographs that Roger collected. And when I came across this in the photo archive, I immediately thought of this painting and lithograph that Roger made in 1986 called Mother and Child. Uh, so a lot of Roger's work, both in terms of the paintings that he made, the sculptures and the prints, but also the way that he collected objects, a lot of it kind of harkens back to his childhood and references his own personal narrative and his own personal experience. And so his upbringing in Alabama was incredibly important. Uh, this piece also brought to mind an interesting painting by Roger called Ancestral Homes of the Type Utilized by My Forefathers, Shotgun, Dog Trot, Slab End, Log Houses. Uh, and so I always thought this painting, which you can see on the left, was kind of a cartoonish depiction of architecture. But seeing this image, you can see what Roger was referencing here. It's a depiction of that kind of traditional Alabama foundation. Um, so this image is just great to show students who are being introduced to Roger Brown just how long ago the 1940s was. But Roger had a really interesting early life. Um, this is a photo of him with his brother Greg. On the left, Greg is an artist who just recently retired from teaching in Alabama. Uh, that's Roger to the right of Greg and then their parents. But Roger uh, grew up in a very religious family. Uh, he grew up, I believe, in the Church of Christ, and he came out to his parents as being gay when he was 17 years old. Um, he saw a church psychiatrist and actually studied for a year to become a minister. So his life almost took a very different path from where he ended up. Um, but eventually he said that he saw a secular psychiatrist who told him to come to a city where he would be accepted. And so in 1963, he moved to Chicago. 
and enrolled at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I always show this image to introduce students to SAIC and the Art Institute in those years because Chicago was a very different city and the museum was very different. Uh, the Prudential building that we see in the background here was actually the tallest building in the city in 1963. So Roger really lived through the years where the um, iconic Chicago skyline was built and formed. And the school itself was also very different. All of the classes that happened at the Art Institute, at the School of the Art Institute, were in the museum itself. So students had this really fantastic ornate entrance. They were able to gain access to the galleries before and after they were open to the public. And because of this, a lot of students, including perhaps especially Roger Brown, formed a really close relationship with the permanent collection at the Art Institute, but also a lot of really important traveling exhibitions that came through and had a huge impact on Roger's work. And so Valerie showed the iconic image of Nighthawks. This painting was made in 1942, one year after Roger was born. But this is one of these works that had a major impact on Roger. Uh, in 1969, as a graduate student, Roger made his very first reference to Nighthawks in this piece called Puerto Rican Wedding. And once you see this connection, you'll start to notice a lot of kind of uh, Nighthawks allusions in Roger's paintings. I'll show a number of others where you can see this if you look at the foreground of some of the works. And so this was a direct reference to Nighthawks. And you can see Roger just wandering the galleries, being really inspired by certain works. He wrote extensively about the uh, panels by the early Renaissance artist Giovanni de Paolo that were in the Art Institute's permanent collection. Uh, he was particularly interested in these because they didn't adhere to one point perspective. So in a 1993 interview with the Los Angeles Times, Rogers stated that, quote, I like 14th century Italian paintings rejection of Renaissance perspective, which dictated that art should look as much like reality as possible, end quote. So looking at these, if you look at the background of the works, you can see the building going in all sorts of different improper directions. They kind of look like quadrants of an MC Escher drawing or something. But Roger was really drawn to this. He wanted paintings to become a space to create strange, mysterious uh, depictions of reality that didn't conform to the actual world. And so we see Roger channeling this depiction of space in a lot of his works throughout his entire career. Uh, this is Busy City Porno Strip from 1978. You see some buildings shooting to the left, others to the right. Space behind that kind of peaked backwards in a really interesting way. There are some people in windows that may be somewhat related to Nighthawks. But seeing these side by side, you can see how Roger is channeling uh, that pre-Renaissance or that rejection of Renaissance in his depiction of space. Uh, this is a painting, The Entry of Christ in Chicago in 1976, that really helped launch Roger's career. It was acquired by the Whitney Museum of American Art. But this was also, I believe, the very first time that Roger painted the iconic Chicago skyline. And so you can see something that he began painting over and over again. You can also see some of his most characteristic motifs, the black silhouette on yellow window, which we see in skyscrapers, uh, the very stylized building, in the foreground, we see references again to that Nighthawk scene of people alone in diners. And then we just have this classic Roger Brown narrative that's really humorous, but also this strange depiction of space with buildings going in all sorts of different directions, taking that Giovanni de Paolo approach even further. But I can't show this painting without really diving into the scene that's going on here. So this is a detail where we have the elder Mayor Daly, uh, Chicago has had two Mayor Daly's. This is the first. And he stands beside the Cardinal, who stands next to Simon and Garfunkel, the folk singing duo. And they are greeting Jesus Christ, who is coming in on a flatbed truck. Um, so this is a great example of Roger's work. It's an art historical reference, of course, recreating a painting of the entry of Christ into Jerusalem. But in that classic Roger Brown use of humor and just the very iconic aesthetic sensibility that Roger used throughout his career. And so on this theme, just to show other examples of Roger's work, uh, this is Museum Without a Ceiling from 1976, definitely referencing the Art Institute, but taking it to a strange, impossible space. Thinking City from 1977, and Snake Building from 1977. And so all of these works were things that he made actually in his home studio after he moved into the Art and after he moved into what is now the Roger Brown Study Collection. And that really allowed him to kind of break free of the canvas and start making these sculptural works that you see here. But back to Roger's studies, uh, Roger received his BFA from SAIC in 1968 and his MFA in 1970. 
He actually dropped out of SAIC after about a semester. I think he may have had a bad experience transitioning from small town Alabama to the big city. Um, he received a two-year degree in commercial design from the American Academy of Arts. And then he returned to SAIC at kind of perfect timing to coincide with a group of artists who eventually became known as the Chicago Imagists. And so this is a photo of Roger Brown on the left. And on the right, we can see Christina Ramberg uh, hugging Phil Hansen. And so they were all students together. They exhibited together and traveled together and became very close friends. But this term Chicago Imagist refers to a group of artists who kind of self-curated a series of shows at the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood that were organized by the Chicago artist and curator Don Baum. Uh, the first of these shows was called Harry Who, and this is Gladys Nelson holding up a Harry Who comic book that those artists produced for that first exhibition. I believe the show was in 1966. And side note, this is actually a still from a documentary film about these artists called Harry Who and the Chicago Imagists. So if any of you are interested in kind of diving into this art historical moment, you can check that out. I believe it's streaming online. So the first Harry Who show was in 1966, and these occurred uh, over the next few years. But in 1968, Roger was included in a show called False Image at that same venue, the Hyde Park Art Center, alongside Phil Hansen and Christina Ramberg, who we see here. So this is the major exhibition that launched Roger's career, False Image, 1968 at the Hyde Park Art Center. We see these really great uh, price lists that they made by hand uh, as posters. And they also produced these decals that Roger made at the decal shop that he was working at. But a lot of these artists, the Chicago images, share some aesthetic sensibilities. And so I'll quickly cycle through some of their work just so you get an idea of what they look like. Uh, this is a painting by Ray Yoshida, who taught at SAIC for over five decades. Roger talked about Ray as being the second major influence on his art and life, only second to George Veranda. This is Christina Ramberg, who we've seen a couple of images of. Barbara Rossi, who made some incredibly detailed what she thought of as portraits using acrylic. This is partially reverse painted on plexiglass. Ed Paschke, who is a very famous Chicago artist. Bill Hansen, who we've seen some images of. Bart Green. Jim Nutt. Gladys Nilsson, who was holding up the Harry Who book. And the truly great Carl Worsom, who just passed away earlier this year. Uh, Carl made this painting in honor of Screaming Jay Hawkins' album Armpit Rubber. You can see uh, the album title right down here. And I believe the album Armpit Rubber was actually eventually re-released with this as the cover. So all of these artists were studying or teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in these years. And they're also all forming their own collection. And so this is that culture of collecting that Roger came from that I spoke about. Uh, almost every Sunday morning, they would go sometimes together to the Maxwell Street Market, which was one of the largest open air markets in America at the time. And so we know a lot of the found objects that Roger had that are now in the RBSC were acquired from Maxwell Street. And just to give you an idea of the sort of overlap in collections between some of these artists, this is Ray Yoshida, that artist that I mentioned had a major impact on Roger as his teacher. Uh, Ray lived about a mile from where the Roger Brown study collection is. But he had a very similar aesthetic in terms of how he installed his artwork. Uh, he also covered his floors, ceilings, all of his shelves with found things, artworks from friends, found objects, and works that he acquired while on the road. And so to fully drive this home, uh, this is the image on the left of Ray Yoshida's home. And on the right, this is an image of the Roger Brown study collection. So I think Roger might be a little bit more maximalist in his installation, but there's a whole lot of overlap. And we're pretty sure that Ray and Roger shopped together when they acquired things because some of their objects are almost identical. And I mentioned Phyllis Kind as being really instrumental in supporting Roger's career. Uh, the Phyllis Kind Gallery was also another space where these artists came together and showed work. So this was a Christmas card that they produced one year. We see some familiar faces in this image at the very top. This is Phil Hansen, Christina Ramberg, Roger Brown. Now we have Carl Worsen here. Uh, Miyoko Ito, and a number of other artists. 
And so a lot of the Chicago images were represented by the Phyllis Kine Gallery. And all of these artists would actually have these kind of gatherings and parties where they would show each other slides of what they were recently acquiring and what they recently discovered while kind of getting out there and forming their collections. So they were really interested in getting out of mainstream art spaces and discovering artists who were working outside of that mainstream, who had their own original visions. And it was because of that interest that they discovered the work of Joseph Yoakum, for example. Um, it was Carl Worsom who first saw the work of Joseph Yoakum at a storefront in the uh, Hyde Park neighborhood in Chicago. But Worsom was completely blown away by Yoakum's work. And so they started going to visit Yoakum kind of after going to the Maxwell Street Market Sunday mornings. And so we see here Lori Gunn uh, next to Carl Worsom, who is holding their infant daughter, Ruby. Beth Robert Brown. This is the artist, Joseph Yoakum and the familiar faces, Phil Hanson and Christina Ramberg. So Joseph Yoakum was a really interesting artist who started drawing in his seventies after he claimed that God came to him in a dream and told him to make a single drawing every day for 10 straight years. And so he produced a massive amount of work and Roger collected more works by Joseph Yoakum than any other artist in any of our collections, all three of the homes that Roger gave to the School of the Art Institute. So the image that you see on the left here is what we call the Yoakum room. This is Roger's guest bedroom, that's a pull-out sofa. But he completely surrounded this room in drawings by Joseph Yoakum. And these really drew Roger in. Um, Yoakum is a great example of why Roger wanted to explore spaces outside of the Art Institute and places like that to find more original visions. Yoakum's drawings started in kind of ballpoint pen and then moved into pencil and colored pencil combined with ink to create these amazing patterned spaces that like Giovanni Di Paolo did not at all conform to one point perspective or reality in any way. These are very imaginative, very intuitive and very internal rather than external. So there are endless connections between the objects that Roger acquired and the artwork that he was making uh, throughout his career. And so we can go side by side of showing some of the Joseph Yoakum drawings that Roger collected that are still in the RBSC and looking at various landscapes from Roger's career. So on the left, we have that classic Roger Brown oil paint slick colors. And on the right, a very different kind of aesthetic, very different materials. But thinking about pattern and thinking about repetition, there's absolutely some overlap between these artists. And you can see how Roger was inspired by these strange visionary spaces that Joseph Yoakum was drawing over and over and over again. The impossible way that he depicted space and the way that he drew the eye around the canvas and just created things that really spoke to Roger as an individual artist. And Roger made a huge number of landscapes that are definitely channeling the work of Yoakum. I could spend hours looking at these side by side. But Lee Godey is another Chicago artist who Roger got to know personally. Uh, Lee was another one of these interesting characters. She would sell her work on the steps of the Art Institute uh, sometimes calling herself a French Impressionist because she knew that that's what people were going to the museum to see. And she also became a marketer of her own work. Um, you can see here, she painted portraits that had a very distinctive style. Um, and this image was taken by Roger Brown and it's of a party that she threw for some friends that she called the Red Party. So here we can see George Veranda holding up the painting that he and Roger acquired. And this is a very rare snapshot of Lee Godey. Uh, Lee sometimes took, photo, took photos of herself in kind of public photo booths, but was rarely seen in snapshots. So this shows that she kind of trusted in new Roger. Um, but Roger has a number of works by Lee in the collection. And Roger was just really interested in kind of getting out of the city and going through rural America to find works that were not represented or just not found in places like Chicago. So we know that he came across the work of Elijah Pierce, who was working in Columbus, Ohio. We have an example of Elijah's work in our bedroom. Uh, several times, Roger visited the 20 acres of land that Jesse Howard had in Fulton, Missouri, and he acquired a number of signs from this property. We have one drawing by Bill Trailer that's in the bedroom. Roger placed it right next to his bed, so that might mean that it was important to him. And you can see why it has that silhouetted style that Roger incorporated into a lot of his own mature work. And William Dawson, I'll pause on because William was another person that Roger really had an affinity with. Um, like Roger Brown, William was born in Alabama, but then later on lived and worked in the city of Chicago. 
And Dawson made a huge collection of work that consisted of sculptures, paintings, sometimes hybridized pieces that incorporated found objects like bones. And Roger acquired dozens of these objects that we can see throughout the Roger Brown study collection. So here he is placing uh, William Dawson sculptures beside a painting that he made as a graduate student. And we have some other items, some more examples of the works that Dawson made. He's very well known for these interesting kind of human totem poles. And Robert also supported the artists whose work he collected. Uh, he can be seen here at a major art opening for William Dawson's work. And on that note, I will end the kind of dive into biographies of different artists from our collection on Aldo Piacenza, uh, who Roger really import, supported in a very important way. But Piacenza covered his home in murals of the Italian countryside. <clears throat> this is an image of his yard that Roger Brown took. And his yard was also full of these whirly gigs that he created. And Roger was most drawn to these cathedrals that he made, some of which were actually birdhouses. Uh, so like Roger Brown, Aldo Piacenza was really interested in kind of going back to his own childhood, drawing from his nostalgic references and his upbringing. So a lot of these were made or modeled after churches that he remembered seeing growing up in Italy. Uh, Roger became completely enamored with the work of Piacenza. And so like Joachim and like Dawson, they can be found throughout our collection, including uh, this really nice area where you can see them all side by side with a great S.L. Jones sculpture of Uncle Sam. And one of these actually still has a bird's nest inside. We have preserved this to be as it was when Roger bought it and left it to us. But really importantly, Roger curated an exhibition of Aldo Piacenza's work at the Hyde Park Art Center in 1971. So this is the exact same venue that Roger launched his own career through. And this goes back to what Valerie was saying is Roger being an artist, a collector, and a curator. Um, this is Roger one year out of graduate school. We have these really fantastic sketches that he made. Uh, this is a great example of how Roger made his sketches. But he kind of planned out the exhibition in the Hyde Park Art Center to recreate Piacenza's yard. He was interested in kind of retaining the original setting through which these artworks were meant to be experienced. And so the gallery was transformed into this kind of very Roger Brown maximalist installation where we have a white picket fence uh, covered in foliage with countless birdhouses placed throughout the entire space. Um, Piacenza's paintings were included and a number of other works. Roger was really into just covering every space possible. But I wanted to end with him just on this note that Roger supported the artists that he collected in very important ways. Um, he curated Aldo Piacenza's work into the exact same venue, the Hyde Park Art Center that launched his own career. And so I think it's very important to note that Roger really thought of these artists as his peers. And so many of the artists that I've just shown, uh, Joseph Yoakum, Lee Godey, Elijah Pierce, uh, Jeffy Howard, Bill Trailer, William Dawson, and Aldo Piacenza, none of these artists were formally trained and none of them were represented by major galleries when Roger first started collecting their work. So the support that they got from Roger was really important and some of them now are incredibly well known. For example, Joseph Yoakum has a major exhibition on view at the Art Institute of Chicago. If any of you can see it, I highly recommend it. Um, and that show will actually travel to MoMA in New York and also the Manil Collection in Houston. But on that note, we will now dive into a video tour of the Roger Brown Study Collection. And so I will change modes quickly here. And we have a virtual tour that was made by a former staff member. And so I will kind of go back and forth from this virtual space to HD footage that shows you the actual uh, feeling of walking through the Roger Brown study collection. So I've worked at the RBSC for a decade now and seeing the space represented in this way kind of blows my mind every time I experience it. You can see our front room was Roger's former studio space. The back room was his workspace. And the second floor is the collection that we have intact as he installed it.
So this is a view of our building from Halstead Street. We're located at 1926 North Halstead. And this is a view of walking north, entering that entrance that Roger was standing in front of in that photo of him in 1974. So the room when you immediately walk in is now our kind of exhibition space, our orientation space and library. We give lectures here and introduce students to the Roger Brown study collection. But when Roger was living here, this was his studio space. So this was a workspace for him. And this is what allowed his career to really take off. In the mid 1970s, he started making these large scale works, these sculptures. And it was a really kind of a private space. If you were a friend of Roger's, you wouldn't actually enter the studio. Um, instead, you would go through this north door, which leads you to a staircase that goes directly upstairs to both the collection and the living area. So here we are ascending the staircase to the virtual tour. The staircase was designed by George Veranda. And you just immediately see Roger's interest in covering every surface of the wall with objects. We can see some hand-painted signs by Jesse Howard on the right there. I showed an image of his site in Fulton, Missouri. There is a painting by Sue Ellen Roca, a drawing by Martin Ramirez on the right. You can see religious objects sprinkled throughout this area of the collection. And this great shelf that Roger filled with objects, a lot of which kind of harken back to his own childhood things that perhaps he grew up with or remembered seeing when he was a kid. And so this is the orientation of our space. And it's really interesting to just dive uh, room by room to look at certain areas. And so I'll kind of be going back and forth from this view into direct views. Right now we're in the north hallway and we'll be entering the living room. And the living room is where we can really see George's intervention in this space. Um, this room was originally divided into much smaller spaces. And so George tore down some walls and installed those shelves. And we can see a lot of great works made by these Chicago imagists, like that Jim Nutt painting. And it's just a great example of how much you can see together in one kind of line of vision when you move throughout our space. I think every time we have a tour at the RBSC, we have a different series of questions because people notice different objects and kind of react to different things. And even after working there for a decade, um, I'm finding myself seeing things in new ways or feeling like I haven't seen something before. So Roger, for example, covered that Mies van der Rohe X-frame table with objects from all over the world. We are still tracing the exact history of a lot of these objects and their provenance. But these are more views of the living and dining room. It's a great Carl Worsen sculpture in the middle. We have one drawing by Henry Darger hanging from the ceiling. <clears throat> and we'll now go through the dining room, down the hall, into the master bedroom, which is a kind of small and intimate master bedroom. And so here, Roger has some works that he made as a graduate student and undergrad. We have some quilts that we leave on his bed so that we can show them to guests. He has this incredible hand-drawn drawing by Barbara Rossi that's one of the most exquisite works on paper that I've ever seen. Um, it's impossible to convey through our 3D tour, so these are some detail shots. These are the works by William Dawson. We can see Mexican folk art sprinkled throughout the collection. And this is a pie safe that Roger referred to as his genealogy cabinet. Going down the hallway from the bedroom, we enter the Yoakum room. Uh, we do take the Joseph Yoakum drawings down for six months of every year to stop the degradation caused by their exposure to light. But this is really where you can investigate the work of Joseph Yoakum and spend a lot of time looking at all of the different practices he developed throughout his entire career. Uh, we currently have 10 of these works on loan to the traveling exhibition that is currently on view at the Art Institute of Chicago. 
you can see that these are labeled with the locations that Yoakum was supposed to be depicting. And one of the most important spaces in our museum is what we call the central staircase. Uh, this is another very important George Baranda intervention. This originally would have been blocked off by walls on both sides and doors, so it would have been dark. But George tore down those walls and completely opened it up so that it's this free flowing architectural space. And really, you can see almost the entire collection from standing on either side of the staircase here. We have this great sculpture by Don Baum in the foreground. Across the other side, we have that bizarre painting by Paul Lamantia and some textile works by Phil Hansen. A painting by Miyoko Ito on the left above a Gladys Nelson watercolor. This takes us to the kitchen where we have a few objects, uh, sort of non-perishable -per food items that Roger acquired that were recreated by a student from memory. These are the only things that we've added to the Roger Brown study collection. And on the way to the den, we pass a really great sculpture by Margaret Wharton. And this is the space we spent, we think Roger kind of spent most of his day-to-day -day time here. Um, we have one, Roger made one moving image piece, one film or video called Roger Brown Presents. And these were home videos that he cut up. And so you can see that playing on the TV there. Uh, when guests view our space, we play that so they can experience this like perfect Roger Brown, very nostalgic video piece. Those are the Aldo Piacenza Birdhouse Cathedrals. Some Phil Hansen paintings way up there. And a number of other kind of hand constructed building structures that Roger placed alongside those Piacenza houses. The coffee tables were not used to set coffee on, they're completely covered in objects. And this popsicle stick lamp with the Phantom of the Opera figure is one of our most popular arrangements as well. So I know we're running short on time and this is just about to wrap up, but we will descend the staircase. It's a great painting by Ray Yoshida there. And this will lead us into the back room space, which was Roger's wood shop where he made a lot of his sculptures and stretched his canvases. This is now an office space for us. And that leads to our backyard, which is a really fantastic resource to have, especially in the summer. And um, we have a lot of departmental retreats and other events that occur back here. And I mentioned that in the garage, we have Roger's 1967 Ford Mustang, which is another one of our incredibly popular objects. Uh, Roger left this with us and specifically wanted it to be a part of the Roger Brown study collection. And so we kind of break past museum rules and we allow guests to sit inside of this and have their photo taken. So the tour is really fantastic. Um, the former staff member, Angelina Amakamatova, who made this, did a really great job with it. And you can access it on our website. Um, so I could spend hours talking about all of the various objects that are in the collection, of course. I won't do that, but for those of you who are interested in continuing to explore our space, you can do so at saic.edu slash Roger Brown. But I will now hand it over to Rachel who will continue the program. James, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, such great detail, so much information. I think we all have a lot to absorb. Um, so for those of you who are willing to stick with us for just a little bit longer, we would love to answer some of the questions that have come in through the Q&A box. Um, I'll just start with um, a question regarding where Roger Brown was acquiring his folk art and objects. Did he travel a lot? Yeah, Roger. Uh, traveled extensively. We have a really interesting map that he made of his different road trips where he has like years of where he went when. Um, but he also acquired a lot of things from collectors who knew that he was a person interested in certain types of objects. And so one thing we're doing right now is going through our archive and matching objects to receipts, which is a really interesting challenge because a lot of these have like very vague terms. 
um, like uh, Mask or something like that. Um, but Roger, for Roger, road trips were incredibly important. So he would have really loved this whole series of events and uh, would have followed the paths of everywhere we're kind of going. Um, but yeah, we know that Roger traveled a lot and we're still really uncovering the origin of where everything came from. I guess a little bit of a jump off from the collection management. Um, how do you keep everything dusted? So somehow the RBSC is the least dusty home that I've ever seen. I honestly don't know how it's so clean. Um, we do have the air ducts kind of vacuumed out once a decade or so, um, but we do assign uh, student staff like one room every couple of years to fully dust and clean. Um, and really the building kind of everything blends into itself. You only see the dust if you look really, really closely. But like I have to dust my own home every couple of weeks. We dust there every year or two. So it's really not that bad. So there's a question here about why and how it was decided to be called the study collection rather than a home or studio or museum. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, I actually wasn't around when they decided on that name, but I think it is just to imply that our whole role, our um, purpose and our mission is to serve students at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago who are studying in uh, the various degrees that they offer. And I do remember when I was a student that there was talk about changing it to the Roger Brown House Museum to be a little bit more straightforward. And then we just decided, I believe, that um, we became known as the Roger Brown Study Collection and so we would retain that name. Yeah, we have a couple questions here about being open to visitors. Yeah, important question. Um, we are currently not open to visitors um, because we're part of SAIC's campus and there are restrictions of campus access related to COVID-19. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to open soon. Um, outside of COVID, we're always open by appointment only. So we're not a, the kind of place you can walk into because we do have limited staff. Um, but we're hoping to be able to reopen to the public sometime in the coming months. And so keep an eye on our website, uh, saic.edu slash Roger Brown for those announcements. Thanks for that. We have a question about um, how involved Roger was in the design of his homes in partnership with Rhonda. Ooh, that's really interesting, actually. Um, I think Roger wrote about in that for George autobiography that George, from what Roger wrote, I think that George really took on the architectural projects himself. Roger wrote about how he was willing to like live with all of the imperfections of the building when he found it. And then he was just blown away with George's vision for completely reconstructing the interior. And I think that's why I've started to cite George as being so important in our space because it almost felt like he was handing that level of creative control over to George, who I think really did a fantastic job with it. Um, Roger talked about how George would work with him to kind of arrange objects within spaces, but Roger never really wrote about um, kind of the other way around. And of course, I'm sure they had many conversations about the design of their home in New Buffalo. Um, yeah, a question about if the building has a basement or an attic. We have a basement um, where we we don't open it to the public, so we left it out of the virtual tour. And then we have this like terrifying crawl space attic um, that we've had to crawl into once to like reinforce the Henry Darger's painting or drawing that's hanging from the ceiling. Uh, so we do have those, but they're not uh, safe enough to open to the public. And so the attic is basically nothing. And then in the basement, we store some materials. Um, no, uh, nothing that shouldn't be stored in the basement, of course, but we're very low on storage space. Um, a couple questions about um, access to the transcript of today's event. Um, if you would like access to the transcript um, from today's event, please feel free to reach out to us at jamescastlehouse at cityofboise.org, and we would be more than happy to send you the transcript. Um, we also have a question about previous tours. Um, the previous uh, Historic Artist Homes and tu Studio Tours so far have been listed on the James Castle House YouTube page. Um, so give that a search and you should find those. Um, I have a question for you and I actually have two questions, but I think I'm going to focus on sort of a more abstract question about Roger's relationship to collecting. I mean, I think it's always so interesting um, to, 
explore the things that artists collect and how those objects inform their work and play a role in sort of their own research uh, that they do to expand and grow their, their body, their studio practice. So I'm just curious um, how Roger lived with his objects and if it was about amassing a collection or a relationship with an object. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. And I think um, he wrote about how eventually, uh, like we think of this space as a museum. And uh, so when I'm in there, I handle everything very carefully. And Lisa Stone, when it was first turned into a museum, she talked about how some of Roger's friends would just come over, sit down on the couch, with some objects on it, and like open his liquor cabinet, because to them, it was just their friend's house. And so it's interesting to consider to be constantly surrounded by these objects. Um, he talked about how eventually it just became like a home for him. But I think it's so important to remember that when he wasn't in his studio space, he was still surrounded by things that he had very personal connections to, but also that he had aesthetic connections to. And so some of the objects that we have were very personally meaningful to him, things that his father made for him. Um, the pie safe, for example, where he kept a lot of other family objects. There were things that he traded uh, friends for. So like he has a Jim Nut print that perhaps he gave a Roger Brown print for. Um, so it's a combination, I think, of like very personal connections to things and then very intuitive reactions to objects. Um, and then certain artworks and certain artists he just absolutely fell in love with. But I think all of it was to, all of it was eventually channeled into his art practice in really interesting ways. And we could literally look at thousands and thousands of combinations of things in our collection and Roger's artworks to just see new and exciting um, aesthetic correlations that I would never pick up on. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. So as the newly ordained collection manager, are you still in the process of cataloging the full collection? Has that already been cataloged? And then I, one question that came up that fits into this is what, um, what system software are you using to do your cataloging? Yeah, so the whole collection has been cataloged, but we still need to research and uh, track the provenance of everything. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and I mentioned that I'm an artist, I make new media work. And so I have an interesting background when I started working at the RBSC as a student intern, which was 15 years ago this fall. Um, I was a painter, but then SAIC doesn't allow you to pick majors. So I wandered around and eventually became a new media artist. And I just became frustrated with the interfaces of a lot of um, museum databases. And so I started designing custom databases for our different collections. And this really allowed us to kind of pick up on our research and our cataloging. And so for the past year, especially with COVID, we've, all of my student staff members and I have really been diving into this aspect of our, uh, of our work, cataloging, uh, cataloging the collection itself, Rogers Library, uh, the archive, we have a really exciting new archive database with thousands of documents that are almost fully cataloged, um, Rogers flat files, um, and a number of other things. And so we're now creating a series of tools that we're using to kind of cross reference to fully tell the story of the collection and um, just create very dynamic tools that are now accessible on campus to SAIC students to allow people to digitally explore these collections. And so we're hoping to publish some of those online um, to the public. We also track Roger's artworks. Um, and we do have an online database that we link to um, from our website, saisd.edu slash Roger Brown of Roger's artworks, all of his paintings and sculptures and all of his sketchbooks, if you want to explore those. That's such an incredible resource for all of us, but also what an amazing opportunity for students to have access to um, work with the collection. Um, well, so out of respect of everyone's time, I'm going to close this out. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today on the tour. And thank you, James and Valerie, for your generosity um, today. Uh, we are presenting this as a collaboration through the Boise City Department of Arts and History's James Castle House and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, along with the Roger Brown Study Collection. I wanna make sure I thank the staff at the James Castle House who have helped to bring this program to life. To Valerie, obviously, for so fearlessly committing to this program. 
and uh, to all of you for joining us on uh, yet again another Zoom call. Your support really does mean a lot to us and um, we hope you will join us at our next road trip stop, the last of our series, um, which will take place August 9th at the Dorsey, Dorothy Reister House and Studio. Um, but for those of you who are anxious to actually do this road trip on your own, in your own car, um, I highly recommend checking out the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Guidebook. Um, this is available online at many major retailers, as well as the James Castle House online store. Um, it is an amazing resource, a highly visual guidebook that shares 256 pages of amazing images of sites and artists um, and the site stories all grouped by U.S. region. So it makes it pretty much impossible to go on a road trip and not stop at any one of these sites. So um, thank you all so much and we will see you next month. Thanks. Take care.